It's Wednesday, December 1st, and the biggest challenge to abortion rights in decades. The Supreme Court's conservative majority justices signal today they will allow states to ban abortion much earlier in pregnancy, and they're indicating they may go even further to overturn altogether the nationwide Roe v. Wade right that has existed for nearly 50 years. What constitutional right protects the right to abortion? Um, is it privacy? Is it autonomy? What would it be? It's liberty, Your Honor. It's the uh, textual protection in the 14th Amendment that a state can't deprive a person of liberty without due process of law. And the court has interpreted liberty to include the right to make a family decisions and the right to physical autonomy, including the right to end a previability pregnancy. A person in San Francisco, the first in the United States to have an identified case of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. The California and San Francisco Departments of Public Health and the CDC have confirmed that a recent case of COVID-19 among an individual in California was caused by the Omicron variant. Dr. Anthony Fauci said genomic sequencing conducted at the University of California, San Francisco was confirmed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The person had recently traveled to South Africa. The White House and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, commemorate World AIDS Day today by launching new campaigns to combat HIV AIDS. A 15-year-old boy charged with murder and terrorism for a mass school shooting that killed four fellow students and injured others at the Oxford High School in Michigan. Ethan Crumbly is to be tried as an adult. The House panel investigating the January 6th U.S. Capitol insurrection votes to pursue contempt charges against Jeffrey Clark, a former Justice Department official who refused to answer the committee's questions, even as the committee agrees to let him come back for another try when at the 11th hour he invokes his fifth amendment right against self-incrimination and minnesota congresswoman ilhan omar reveals a harrowing death threat that she says she received hours after she got off the phone with colorado republican Lauren Boebert, who called Omar a member of the Jihad squad and likened her to a bomb-carrying terrorist. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. The United States Supreme Court looks poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, the landmark ruling that recognized a right to abortion nationwide. The state of Mississippi is asking the court to uphold a state ban on abortions after 15 weeks, long before the viability standard set by another Supreme Court ruling. About half of the states have laws already on the books or ready to go that would ban abortions if Roe v. Wade is repealed. Christopher Martinez reports. The state of Mississippi is asking the Supreme Court to do more than uphold Mississippi's ban on abortions after 15 weeks. It's asking it to overturn a pair of landmark abortion rulings, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Mississippi Solicitor General Scott Stewart argued the case for the state. We're, we're running on 50 years of Roe. It is an egregiously wrong decision that has inflicted tremendous damage on our country and will continue to do so and take innumerable human lives unless and until this court overrules it. We ask the court to do so in this case and uphold the state's law. At issue is a Mississippi law called HB 1510, the Gestational Age Act. It would ban abortions after 15 weeks, with no exception for rape or incest. It was blocked from taking effect by lower federal courts. Jackson Women's Health Organization, also known as the Pink House, is the last abortion clinic left in Mississippi. It sued to block the law and won, leading to the Supreme Court appeal. Julie Reckleman is litigation director at the Center for Reproductive Rights. She argued the case for the clinic. 
Mississippi's ban on abortion two months before viability is flatly unconstitutional under decades of precedent. Mississippi asks the court to dismantle this precedent and allow states to force women to remain pregnant and give birth against their will. The court should refuse to do so. She says eliminating or reducing the right to abortion would, in her words, propel women backwards. The Biden administration also weighed in at the hearing. Elizabeth Prelogar is U.S. Solicitor General. She says the effect of overturning Roe and Casey precedents, in legal terms, that's called stare decisis, would be severe and swift, noting that nearly half of all states have already enacted or prepared abortion bans. If this court renounces the liberty interest recognized in Roe and reaffirmed in Casey, it would be an unprecedented contraction of individual rights and a stark departure from principles of stare decisis. The court has never revoked a right that is so fundamental to so many Americans and so central to their ability to participate fully and equally in society. The court should not overrule this central component of women's liberty. The state of Mississippi says the issue of abortion should be left to the states, since the Constitution is neutral on the issue. Justice Brett Kavanaugh seemed receptive to that argument. Why should this court be the arbiter rather than uh, Congress, the state legislatures, state Supreme Courts, the people being able to uh, resolve this? And there'll be different answers in Mississippi and New York, uh, different answers in Alabama than California. Um, because there are two different interests at stake, and the people in those states might value those interests somewhat differently. Chief Justice John Roberts did not directly address overturning Roe, instead zooming in on the 15-day ban. He asked why 15 days would not be enough time. It is the standard that the vast majority of other countries have. Uh, When you get to the viability standard, we share uh, uh, that standard with the People's Republic of China and North Korea. And I don't think you have to be in favor of looking to international law to set our constitutional standards to be concerned if those are your share that particular time period. Rackleman corrected the facts, noting that the majority of countries with laws on the issue use viability, not 15 days. She said the ban would especially hurt certain women. Mississippi's ban would particularly hurt women with a major health or life change during the course of a pregnancy. Poor women who are twice as likely to be delayed in accessing care. And young people or those in contraception who take longer to recognize a pregnancy. Other conservative justices, who make up a majority on the high court, seemed more eager to overturn Roe. Justice Clarence Thomas asked Rackleman about the very basis for a right to abortion. What constitutional right protects the right to abortion? Um, Is it privacy? Is it autonomy? What would it be? It's liberty, Your Honor. It's the uh, textual protection in the 14th Amendment that a state can't deprive a person of liberty without due process of law. The more liberal three justices seemed more reluctant to overturn the precedent on abortion. Justice Sonia Sotomayor worried about the effect on the Supreme Court. Now, um, the sponsors of this bill, the House bill in Mississippi, said we're doing it because we have new justices. The newest ban that Mississippi has put in place, the six-week ban, the Senate sponsor said, we're doing it because we have new justices on the Supreme Court. Will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts? The court is expected to make its ruling by next summer. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. In San Francisco today, pro-choice advocates were to rally at the federal building this afternoon. One of the organizers, Norma Gay, ghost of Radical Women San Francisco, said the fundamental right to abortion as health care for everyone, especially women of color, is a matter of life and death. The U.S. identified its first known case of the Omicron COVID-19 variant today in a vaccinated traveler returning to San Francisco from South Africa.
Scientists around the world are racing to establish whether the new mutant version of the coronavirus is more dangerous than the previous ones. The person had mild symptoms that are improving and has agreed to remain in quarantine. All the individual's close contacts have been contacted and have tested negative for COVID-19. KPFA's Christina Onestead reports. The anonymous San Francisco resident was in the city a week before they tested positive with the Omicron variant of COVID-19, the first in the U.S. to do so. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Anthony Fauci made the announcement. The individual was a traveler who returned from South Africa on November the 22nd and tested positive on November the 29th. The individual is self-quarantining and all close contacts have been contacted and all close contacts thus far have tested negative. The individual was fully vaccinated and experienced mild symptoms which are improving at this point. So this is the first confirmed case of COVID-19 caused by the Omicron variant detected in the United States. Researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, obtained a sample from the patient Tuesday night and worked feverishly into the wee hours of the morning to assemble the genetic sequence, finding it to be the Omicron variant. The Centers of Disease Control and Prevention then confirmed the genome sequence. California Governor Gavin Newsom says it was inevitable and hailed the state's leadership in biotechnology for the find. He spoke at an event to promote vaccinations in Merced, noting 91% of California adults have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. This was predicted um, and it, again, is not surprising the state of California because of its sequencing and because of its aggressive testing protocols, including, by the way, creation of our own state testing lab and the work we continue to do to lean in and, uh, and not be shy in terms of being led by science. Newsom also expressed confidence in the state's efforts to control the virus and says he doesn't anticipate imposing another stay-at-home order or other shutdown measures. That's the same message coming from San Francisco officials. San Francisco Public Health Director Grant Colfax praised the infected person for reporting their symptoms, noting they were vaccinated and have since fully recovered. Get your booster if you're eligible. Continue to wear those masks inside where required. Continue to take the steps that we know that have been successful in San Francisco to prevent major loss of life and to slow the spread of this virus. We know how to do this in San Francisco. At this time, we do not anticipate changing any of our health orders or changing any current restrictions or imposing new restrictions on activity in San Francisco. We're obviously following these developments very closely. We will share additional information as we have it. Little is known about the severity of the Omicron COVID-19 variant. The state's top doctor, Health and Human Services Secretary Dr. Mark Galley, says while there is more to learn about the Omicron variant, the fact that the vaccinated person had mild symptoms is promising. The evidence that an individual with Omicron identified by sequencing uh, actually has uh, mild symptoms, is improving, I think is a testimony to the importance of the vaccinations. We have a lot more to learn about Omicron. We have a lot more to learn about the effect and impact uh, the vaccinations will have, whether it's more virulent, whether it affects kids more than prior strains, the Delta or others. Uh, so we still have a lot to learn, and that's doubling down on the message of vigilance. We ask Californians to do the things the governor said. Get vaccinated, get boosted if you're eligible now. Don't wait. Officials say Omicron is more transmissible than the Delta variant. It's unclear if it's more deadly. At least 23 other countries have reported Omicron infections. Joining the U.S. in reporting first-time cases are Nigeria and Saudi Arabia, marking the first known Omicron infections in West Africa, the Persian Gulf region, and North America. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. Airlines are being required to gather information about some passengers that will help with contact tracing 
If those passengers develop COVID-19, the new rules for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention apply to passengers entering the U.S. who have been in southern Africa in the previous two weeks. The CDC issued the order today. It follows President Biden's ban on travel to the U.S. by foreign nationals who have been in any of eight southern African countries recently. That travel ban doesn't apply to American citizens or permanent U.S. residents. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online kpfa.org. South Africa's new cases of COVID-19 have nearly doubled in just one day. The numbers signal a dramatic surge in the country where scientists detected the Omicron variant last week. New confirmed cases rose to 8,561 today from 4,373 a day earlier. Scientists in South Africa say they're bracing for a rapid increase in COVID-19 cases following the discovery of the new Omicron variant. Dr. Nixi Gumedi Mowaletsi, regional virologist for the World Health Organization, said there's a possibility that South Africa is going to see a vast increase in the number of new cases. The Omicron variant has been detected in five of South Africa's nine provinces and accounts for nearly three-quarters of the virus genome sequenced in November. The chief of the European Union's executive arm said today that EU nations should consider making COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory because too many people in Europe still refuse to get shots voluntarily. The EU-wide vaccination rate stands at 66%, two-thirds. And unexpectedly high case surges in much of the 27-nation bloc has led many member countries to renew mask and testing requirements and to take other steps to curb infections. Simon Marks reports. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said today EU member states should now consider making COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory. She said the Omicron variant makes it even more important for the vast majority of Europeans to get jabbed. It is understandable and appropriate to lead this discussion now, how we can encourage and potentially think about mandatory vaccination within the European Union. This needs discussion. In Britain, nine more cases of Omicron were identified today, taking the total number of cases there to 31. Simon Marks reporting. The European Union is proposing a nine-month expiration date for COVID-19 vaccines that would apply to those traveling to and in the 27-nation member bloc. That could spur the use of booster shots, but the EU commission at its meeting last week did not specify any expiration dates for booster shots. It's also proposing to allow children aged 6 to 17 to be allowed into the country without a vaccine if they test negative for COVID-19 before departure. It would be up to individual countries to impose further restrictions if they wish, like quarantines and or tests after arrival. Navajo leaders and public health officials are urging citizens of the Navajo Nation to take COVID-19 precautions as concerns grow over the spread of the Omicron variant of the disease. Antonia Gonzalez reports. Navajo leaders and public health officials in a virtual town hall Tuesday asked Navajo citizens to be careful and to protect their families and others by getting vaccinated and to continue to wear masks in public. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez. We want to make sure that we are all prepared. We warrior up as we go into the holiday, the Christmas season, the New Year's uh, holidays here. And it's upon all of us. It's not all upon government. It's not upon Washington, D.C. It's upon you. Navajo health officials say they're currently addressing the Delta variant while monitoring Omicron as part of the tribe's public health response to COVID-19. Internal medicine specialist, Dr. Va. Working in a collaborative effort, we've, we've already made Omicron a priority to be able to pick up and detect should it be here in Navajo Nation. As of now, none of the samples have come back positive for Omicron. It's still very much Delta. We are monitoring this and we have the tools and systems in place to do so and that are actively doing so right now. 
Health officials say Omicron has an unusual combination of mutations and is quite different than the Delta and other variants. It's causing disease in people who have recovered from Delta. According to the World Health Organization, Omicron is spreading in South Africa and is expected to be detected around the world. U.S. officials are preparing for its arrival. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. A 15-year-old boy was charged with murder for a shooting that killed four fellow students and injured more at a Michigan high school, authorities said today, as they revealed additional details, including a meeting between troubled officials of the school and his parents just a few hours before the bloodshed. No motive was offered by Oakland County authorities a day after violence at Oxford High School, which is roughly 30 miles north of Detroit. The prosecutor said the shooting was not just an impulsive act, but was premeditated based on a mountain of digital evidence. A sheriff's lieutenant told a judge that the shooter recorded a video the night before the violence in which he discussed killing students. More from reporter Simon Marks. The 15-year-old suspect accused of killing four students at a Michigan high school in a shooting attack on Tuesday is facing charges of first-degree murder and terrorism. A fourth teenager died in hospital today, making Tuesday's attack the deadliest school shooting in America this year. Seven other people were injured. Karen McDonald, the prosecutor in Oakland County, Michigan, announced that the suspect will be tried as an adult. We are charging this individual with one count of terrorism causing death four counts of first-degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder, and 12 counts of possession of a firearm and the commission of a felony. Police say the 15-year-old suspect, Ethan Crumbly, used a handgun that was purchased by his father just days before the attack. Ms. McDonald said she may still bring charges against the parents as well. Simon Marks reporting. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld California's ban on high-capacity magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition. That issue may be headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The appeals court vote of 7-4 to four came after it reheard the case and overturned a decision from a smaller panel of the court. That panel had voted two to one that the state's ban on high-capacity magazines was unconstitutional. The California Rifle and Pistol Association had filed the original lawsuit challenging the law, and the association said it will appeal to the Supreme Court. Ninth Circuit Judge Patrick Bumate, who was appointed by former President Trump, wrote a dissent and said large-capacity magazines are, quote, commonly used, unquote, by Americans for self-defense. Gun safety proponents and California Attorney General Rob Bonta hailed the ruling, with Bonta calling it a victory for public safety in the state. He called California's ban on large-capacity magazines a common-sense way to confront an epidemic of gun violence, including devastating mass shootings. Bonta noted that the court's majority said every mass shooting with 20 or more deaths in the last 50 years involved large-capacity magazines, as did about three-quarters of those with 10 or more deaths. The court ruling noted that more than twice as many people were killed or injured in mass shootings with high-capacity magazines than those with less firepower. It is the 40th anniversary of World AIDS Day in San Francisco. The day was to be marked with an evening candlelight ceremony in the National AIDS Memorial Grove in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park beginning at 4.30 this afternoon. The United Nations estimates that between 27 and 47 million people around the world have died of AIDS-related illnesses since the start of the epidemic in 1981. Nearly 38 million people are living with HIV, including 1.2 million in the United States. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top U.S. infectious disease expert, says the COVID-19 pandemic has diverted scientific and financial resources from the fight against AIDS, seriously impeding global efforts to achieve the U.N. goal of ending AIDS by the year 2030. He told the United Nations General Assembly that tackling COVID-19 has also disrupted supply chains and increased the risk for people with HIV, 
the virus that causes AIDS, of being infected with another deadly virus. The White House and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention commemorated World AIDS Day today by launching new campaigns to combat HIV-AIDS. Nika Mirpur reports. President Joe Biden unveiled a new HIV-AIDS strategy to end the more than 40-year-old epidemic on World AIDS Day. The new strategy asserts that gay and bisexual Black and Latino men are too often stigmatized even as they are disproportionately affected by HIV. It also declares racism a public health threat. Biden says he's asked Congress to approve more than half a billion dollars to combat the epidemic by the UN set date of 2030. And critically, this strategy takes on a racial and gender disparities in our health system that for much too long have affected HIV outcomes in our country to ensure that our national response is a truly equitable response. So we're going to take aggressive action and back it up. We've asked Congress for $670 million in historic budget request for the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the United States Initiative. And I'm confident we're going to get that done. New HIV infections in the country dropped about 8% from 2015 to 2019. But Black and Latino communities, particularly gay and bisexual men, continue to be disproportionately affected, according to data from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but accounted for more than 40% of new infections. The Latinx community makes up 18% of the population, but accounted for nearly 25% of new infections. Historically, gay and bisexual men have been the most disproportionately affected group. They account for about 66% of new HIV infections, even though they are only 2% of the population, according to the CDC. Disparities also persist among women. Black women's HIV infection rate is 11 times that of white women and 4 times that of Latino women. Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra outlines the administration's strategy for these at-risk populations. Provide additional support to the 50 jurisdictions where more than half of the country's new HIV diagnoses occur, as well as seven states with a disproportionate occurrence of HIV in rural areas. Our HHS agencies will also continue to support the global fight to end HIV through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. We're working with countries around the world to train healthcare workers and improve detection, apply the latest research and safest medications, and provide life-saving treatment to those in need. We're partnering with the World Health Organization and others to advance critical policies that will save lives. The administration's strategy to combat AIDS HIV also calls for combating HIV-related stigma and discrimination and providing leadership and employment opportunities for people with or at risk for HIV. The new strategy also puts greater emphasis on harm reduction and syringe service programs, encourages reform of state laws that criminalize behavior of people with HIV for potentially exposing others, and adds focus on the needs of the growing population of people with HIV who are aging. The president expressed disbelief that some states have laws in the book that criminalize spitting in public by HIV-positive people, even though it has been long proven that the virus can't be transmitted through saliva. 35 states have laws that criminalize various forms of HIV exposure, according to the CDC. The CDC also announced a new plan to tackle HIV-AIDS. Dimitri Doskalakis, the CDC's director of the Division of HIV-AIDS Prevention, outlined a plan called ROOT. We must get to the root of the problem by focusing on R for resources delivered to the communities most in need because not all areas can implement the most recent advances in HIV prevention and care. O for reaching people outside of traditional healthcare settings through innovations like HIV self-testing and mobile service. The second O for overcoming systemic racism, homophobia, transphobia, HIV-related stigma, and other ingrained barriers that contribute to disparities, and then T, which stands for a total person approach to care by addressing HIV along with interconnected epidemics such as sexually transmitted infections and hepatitis. According to the CDC, more than 1 million people in the U.S. live with HIV AIDS. While there is no medication for it, viral resistance to the treatment has grown. There remains no cure. For KPFA Pacifica Radio, I'm Nika Mirpur. New York City says the first officially authorized safe havens for people to use heroin and other narcotics have been cleared to open in the city in hopes of curbing 
deadly overdoses. The city is calling them overdose prevention centers. They're more usually known as supervised injection sites. They've been discussed for years in New York and some other cities, including San Francisco, already exist in Canada, Australia, and Europe. Proponents say the facilities save lives. Opponents say they essentially sanction people to harm themselves. Federal law bans operating a place for narcotics use. The city health commissioner says the sites are at existing syringe exchange programs. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle. Uh, The House panel investigating the January 6th U.S. Capitol insurrection voted today to pursue contempt charges against Jeffrey Clark, a former Justice Department official who refused to answer the committee's questions, even as the committee has agreed to let him come back for another try. The committee voted 9-0 to pursue criminal charges against Clark, who embraced Donald Trump's attempt to overturn his election defeat. The chair of the panel, Mississippi Representative Benny Thompson, said the committee had received a last-minute notification from Clark's lawyer that he wants to instead invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Thompson said he believes Clark's attempt to return is a last-ditch attempt to delay the select committee's proceedings, but it agreed to try to interview him again. Clark appeared for a deposition last month but refused to answer any questions, citing Trump's legal efforts to block the committee's investigation. The recommendation of criminal contempt charges against Clark will now go to the full House for a vote, although it's unclear if that will be delayed as the committee has agreed to meet with Clark again. If the House votes to hold Clark in contempt, the Justice Department will then decide whether to prosecute. According to a report earlier this year by the Senate Judiciary Committee, which interviewed several of Clark's colleagues, Trump's pressure culminated in a dramatic White House meeting between the men at which the president mused about elevating Clark to attorney general to better challenge the election outcome. He did not do so after several aides threatened to resign. Meanwhile, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has agreed to cooperate with the panel on a limited basis. It's not clear exactly how limited. A lawyer for Meadows said that he was working with the committee and his staff on an accommodation that would not require Meadows to waive the executive privileges claimed by Trump or forfeit the long-standing position that senior White House aides cannot be compelled to testify before Congress. Still, Meadows' intention to work with the panel is a victory for the seven Democrats and two Republicans on the committee, especially as they seek interviews with lower-profile witnesses who may have important information to share. The committee has so far subpoenaed more than 40 witnesses and interviewed more than 150 people behind closed doors. The top Democrat and the top Republican in the U.S. Senate are voicing confidence that they would pass legislation raising the federal government's $28.9 trillion debt limit soon, averting a catastrophic default. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he expects to pass the increase soon after what he called a good conversation with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Nadia Ramagant files this report. First, let let me assure everyone the government will not default as it never has. And second, the majority leader and I have been having discussions about the way forward. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell on raising the debt limit and avoiding a government shutdown. He and former Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin discussed the nation's borrowing limit in a meeting on Tuesday as an impasse over the debt limit drags on. Congress has until December 15th to act. I'm Nadia Ramlagan for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Student loan borrowers take note. A pause on federal student loan payments is set to end in February. Reporter Eric Tegetoff has the story. 
The moratorium on payments has been in place since March 2020 due to the pandemic, but it will be lifted on January 31st. Andrew Pentis, a certified student loan counselor with the group Student Loan Hero, says the average student loan payment for Idaho borrowers is $274 a month, which can be quite a weight on a typical family budget. The good news for borrowers in the state of Idaho is that more than one out of three of them have a balance of under $10,000. So that's a little more realistic and easier to afford in terms of repayment as opposed to those borrowers with much higher balances. Pentis says people should contact their loan servicer before the pause on payments is lifted and check into their options. He says people could also opt to continue the pause on their payments. But Pentis believes a better situation for many borrowers is to opt for an income-driven repayment plan. What those plans do is cap your monthly dues at a percentage of your income. So if you've lost your job or perhaps seen your wages cut, your new monthly payment on your federal student loans would reflect that change. You could qualify for a monthly payment as low as zero dollars. While there was talk of mass student debt forgiveness at the beginning of Joe Biden's presidency, Pentis says that option is looking less likely. However, he notes there have been changes under the Biden administration, such as a fix to the public service loan forgiveness program to make it easier for government and nonprofit workers to qualify. What's much more likely is that the Biden administration will continue to offer targeted loan forgiveness to groups that are particularly struggling with their student loan debt. For Northern Rockies News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar has revealed a harrowing death threat. She says she received hours after she got off the phone earlier this week with Colorado Republican Lauren Boebert, who called Omar a member of the Jihad squad and likened her to a bomb-carrying terrorist. The recording was filled with racial epithets, expletives, and threatened her life several times. You will not live much longer, bitch. I can almost guarantee you that. For those of you who did not hear it very well, let me read you what the voicemail says. We see you, sand and word, bitch. We know what you are up to. You are all about taking over our country. Don't worry. There is plenty that would love the opportunity to take you off the face of this effing earth. Come get it. But you are effing Muslim piece of You are jihadist. We know what you are. You are effing traitor and you will not live any longer. Omar said condemning remarks such as Boebert's should not be a partisan political issue, and she urged House Republican leaders to do more to tamp down anti-Muslim hatred within their ranks. Yet while some members of the Republican Party have condemned this, to date, the Republican Party leadership has done nothing to hold their members accountable. It is time for the Republican Party to actually do something. Omar was joined by fellow representatives Rashid Talib, Jamal Bowman, and Andre Carson. Carson, who is also Muslim, said he's working with Democratic leadership on a House resolution that could address the issue. Honduras's ruling party conceded defeat yesterday in presidential elections held two days earlier, giving victory to leftist opposition candidate Xiomara Castro and easing fears of another contested vote and violent protests. Tegucigalpa Mayor Nasri Asfura, presidential candidate of the National Party, said in a statement that he had personally congratulated Castro, despite only about half of the voting tallies being counted from Sunday's election. The former first lady had 53% of the votes and Asfura 34%, with 52% of the tallies counted, according to the National Electoral Council. It has 30 days from the election to declare a winner. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken congratulated Castro minutes later. 
As Spurs recognition of the outcome was a relief to many Hondurans who had feared a contested election after a debacle in the election of 2017 led to street protests that left 23 people dead. Following that vote, the government imposed a curfew and only three weeks later declared now outgoing President Juan Orlando Hernandez the winner despite the Organization of American States' observation mission calling for an election redo. Fearing a similar prolonged vote standoff and social unrest, many businesses in Honduras' capital had boarded up their windows for this election. Dana Frank is Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and author of the book, The Long Honduran Night, Resistance, Terror, and the United States in the Aftermath of the Coup. The coup, referring to the 2009 coup that overthrew the presidency of Castro's husband, Manuel Zelaya. The base of all this is, of course, as you said, the 2009 coup that overthrew the government of her husband, Manuel Zelaya, um, and indeed the U.S.-backed coup. And that has led to this fantastic direct um, destruction of the rule of law, of the economy, of the state, of the healthcare system, and the, and tremendous violence caused by security forces and police and gangs and drug traffickers. So the base of that is this tremendous disaster wrought by the national party, the ruling party, since the coup. Um, and I, you know, Shamara first ran in 2013 as part of this a uh, new party at the time, Libre. Um, that was founded out of the resistance to the coup, uh, the first broad opposition party in Honduran history. She ran in 2013, and we don't know who won. Um, She probably won, I think she probably won in 2013, but there was so much fraud, we don't know. Um, Again, in 2004 years ago, she ran as for vice president under Salvador Nasraya, another opposition candidate, and that election was really, really clearly robbed by the ruling party and the dictator Juan Orlando Hernandez. So what's different now is um, some of it is that the 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 base for Shamara is just broader and broader and the national party's patronage system and ability to control things weaker and weaker but you know more importantly you know in the polling data she was so far ahead very clearly in august and in october Nasraya, who was running from a different party, threw his support behind her. So it was very clear at that point in October that together they would have 50 percent. And so it was much harder to steal it this time because when they people didn't know and how how clear the opposition lead was last time. And it was very baldly stolen last time by the government's control of the election machinery. But this time there was more oversight of election machinery. And it was also much, much more difficult to steal with if you start having some kind of a, if you have a 20 point lead, which is as it's turned out. And that's including the, the fraud and intimidation of both I mean, that, without that, it would have been even higher. Dana Frank says Castro has clearly won, that the question is still, will she be allowed to take power and govern? I mean, first of all, the election has not yet been certified, and they haven't released any data for, what, 24 hours now? And people are concerned about that because that's what happened in 2017. I think the cat is out of the bag. I don't think they can they can pull it back. And I don't think they can manipulate the numbers with, it, with once she has this 20% lead. Um, but it's still, that's immediately concerning. Then there's the question of whether the United States will recognize the election, which in the past it has recognized the ruling party. So um, uh, I think the U.S. has gone around that corner and will. We can talk about the U.S. response uh, in a sec. But, you know, I think the biggest question looming right now is the police and the military, which are loyal to the outgoing government, I would call dictatorship of President Juan Orlando Hernandez um, and the police and police are tied in with the gangs and they are spectacularly corrupt from top to bottom all over the country and extremely dangerous. And um, and the military are very, very loyal to Juan Orlando. He comes from a military background and has been promoting his people uh, above uh, others within the military, causing some resentment. So, But on the other hand, his people are locked in up at the top. So and the military... Um, it's very much tied with drug traffickers. And we have all of this documented in the Southern District of New York. So it's not just rumor. We know that the, the drug traffickers are embedded and working with 
um, the very, very top of the police and, and uh, military. So the question is, will they allow Xiomara to come to power? Um, the inauguration is January 27th. There's a long, a lot of water under the bridge between now and then. I mean, many people are not, you know, are have been very concerned that there would be a coup already this week. UC Santa Cruz Professor Emeritus Dana Frank is author of The Long Honduran Night, Resistance Terror in the United States in the Aftermath of the Coup. Castro rode a wave of popular discontent with 12 years of National Party governance, which peaked in Juan Orlando Hernandez's second term. She'll face major challenges as the Central American country's first female president. Unemployment is above 10%. Northern Honduras devastated by two major hurricanes last year. And street gangs dragged down the economy with their extortion rackets and violence driving migration to the United States. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. The infrastructure bill recently passed by Congress could provide some much-needed relief for the endangered salmon populations in the Pacific Northwest. Eric Tegatoff reports. Members of the Washington State delegation ensured that the legislation contains $1 billion to remove, fix, and replace culverts, a critical piece of infrastructure that carries streams beneath roads and bridges. Ashley Abrantes is a Ph.D. candidate in environmental science and policy at the University of Washington. She says by state estimates, there are more than 20,000 culverts in need of repair. And the number that has been repaired or replaced in the last decade, it's not even registering as a percent of the number, like a single 1% of the number that need to be repaired. So the overall status is not fantastic. Salmon in the Northwest travel out to the Pacific Ocean and then back to the stream where they were born to spawn. Abrante says the fish have to pass through thousands of culverts along the way, but can't if those passageways are in disrepair. Many populations of salmon in the Northwest are considered threatened or endangered. Abrante says the government is likely to start by repairing the culverts it's responsible for. She says as the law currently reads, local governments will then get to buy for funding. So hopefully cities, counties, and tribal officials will be able to pursue some of that funding to look at some of the culvert issues on a smaller scale than just statewide. The state of Washington has an obligation to ensure safe passage for salmon and other fish through culverts on treaty lands in the western part of the state. A 2018 U.S. Supreme Court decision let a district court ruling stand that gives the state a 2030 deadline to fix nearly 500 of the most precarious culverts. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. New Mexico conservation groups are awaiting word on whether the U.S. Forest Service will reverse its plan to remove more than 60 streams and rivers from eligibility for future wild and scenic designation in the Carson National Forest. The plan focuses on wildfire risk reduction and improved public safety, but is written also could allow dams or development along previously protected rivers. Ross Brown has that story. In northern New Mexico's Carson National Forest, many rivers are eligible for federal wild and scenic designation. And conservation groups say a plan to remove more than 60 from that category is short-sighted. Amigos Bravos and other groups are awaiting word on whether the U.S. Forest Service will reverse its proposal to delist the rivers in an updated management plan. Deputy Director Rachel Kahn worries without protections, rivers and streams in northern New Mexico could see new dams, roads, and other development. There's 62 river segments as per the final plan are no longer eligible for inclusion in the National Wild and Scenic Rivers system. So therefore, no longer protected as free-flowing rivers. 
The Forest Service has argued river decisions made 25 years ago were overly broad and included too many rivers as eligible for wild and scenic designation, which must be approved by Congress. The deadline to comment on new management plans for the Carson, Cibola, and Santa Fe National Forests was November 3rd. Amigos Bravas is among the groups that filed objections to the draft plans. New Mexico has suffered from drought for the past 20 years, with rivers seeing record low flows this year. Khan says that makes it more important to keep the rivers in northern New Mexico free-flowing, which isn't guaranteed without protections. She notes the nature of the state's rivers, deemed to have what are known as outstandingly remarkable values in a Forest Service plan adopted 35 years ago, hasn't changed. Those outstandingly remarkable values can be fisheries-related, geologic, scenic, recreation, wildlife. So there's different categories of outstandingly remarkable values. Khan believes officials drafting the Carson National Forest Management Plan should have done a case-by-case review of rivers rather than reevaluating the entire forest. I'm Roz Brown for New Mexico News Connection. In Southern California, advocates are promoting a petition in support of a new wildlife refuge in western Riverside County. They say the area serves as critical habitat to nearly three dozen endangered or threatened species. Suzanne Potter reports. Public lands groups are asking Congress to support the proposed Western Riverside County Wildlife Refuge, a 500,000-acre swath between Hemet and Temecula in Southern California. Hispanic Access Foundation and Defenders of Wildlife are asking people to sign a letter to lawmakers supporting House Resolution 972, which would create the refuge. Marielle Combs with Defenders says the refuge would preserve important habitat and migration routes for many species. It's important, especially in this urban environment. It would connect the Cleveland National Forest and the San Bernardino National Forest. Wildlife refuge status would ensure this area is safe from suburban sprawl. It is home to 146 species, 33 of which are threatened or endangered, including bighorn sheep, the Keno checker spot butterfly, and the red-legged frog. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. Shalane Maxwell's defense attorney sought today to undermine a key accuser's allegation that the British socialite helped financier Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse the woman for years, starting when she was 14. The trial witness, who has said she's using the pseudonym Jane to protect her 22-year acting career, had testified in graphic detail yesterday about the alleged encounters in the 1990s, portraying Maxwell as an active participant. During a methodical cross-examination, defense attorney Laura Menninger today confronted the woman with FBI documents from 2019 and 20, saying she had told the government her memory was foggy on whether Maxwell was present when Epstein molested her and on whether she ever touched her. Other documents claimed she had said that no abuse occurred during a visit to Epstein's ranch in New Mexico. That contradicted her testimony about alleged encounters with him there that she said made her heart sink into her stomach. The witness denied ever changing her story. She challenged the accuracy of the documents, saying her statements were never recorded. This was just someone jotting down notes. A lot of these are not correct, she said. At another point, she responded, I don't recall saying what's written there. She did not dispute other documents, saying she had named several model types and other women, she said, witness participating in group massages with Epstein. Maxwell, who's 59 years old, has pleaded not guilty to charges that prosecutors say showed that she and Epstein were partners in crime. The defense is countered by claiming she's being made a scapegoat for Epstein, who killed himself in his Manhattan jail cell in 2019 as he awaited his own sex trafficking trial. More from reporter Simon Marks. Today, a look at the sex trafficking trial of British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell through the eyes of her brother. Ms. Maxwell denies charges in New York of procuring underage girls for the deceased pedophile financier Jeffrey Epstein and also for herself. Her lawyers say during the course of her trial, they will try and prove she's being scapegoated by prosecutors they say are frustrated that Mr. Epstein's suicide cheated them out of putting him on trial. Ian 
Alan Maxwell says his sister has been continually mistreated during her 17 months in detention. She still has, uh, even last night, as far as I know, uh, torches shone in her face every 15 minutes throughout the night. This has gone on for 16 months. Uh, the court pictures that uh, I've seen, like you've seen, uh, show me that she's uh, extremely thin and uh, frail. And this is uh, entirely due to the regime that she's been put under, uh, which I think has been done to break her. But she is not going to be broken. She has come innocent of the charges and has been very strong in her protest of that fact since the get-go. Prosecutors say they have voluminous evidence to convict Ghislaine Maxwell. She made many pre-trial efforts to be released on bail, complaining of mistreatment. All of them were rejected. Simon Marks reporting. Democrat Stacey Abrams says she's making another run for governor of Georgia. Her announcement today could set up a rematch against Republican Governor Brian Kemp four years after her narrow defeat led her to create a nationwide voting rights organization that helped the state elect Joe Biden and two Democratic senators. The 47-year-old Abrams was the state lawmaker with little profile outside of Georgia when she stepped into the 2018 race, looking to become the state's first African-American and first female governor. Four years later, she enters the contest, widely created for helping Georgia go blue in the presidential election for the first time since 1992 and swinging control of the Senate to Democrats after two runoff victories in the state. The U.S. Supreme Court today took up arguments in a high-stakes abortion case coinciding with divisive arguments over voter fraud, mask mandates, and school curriculum. And recent findings suggest many Americans could use more civics knowledge as they debate these issues. Mike Moen has the story. The U.S. Supreme Court today takes up arguments in a high-stakes abortion case. It coincides with divisive arguments over voter fraud, mask mandates, and school curriculum. Recent findings suggest many Americans could use some more civics knowledge as they debate these issues. This fall, the Annenberg Public Policy Center released its annual survey of overall public smarts about the branches of government. Adults who correctly named all three branches increased to 56 percent, the highest since the survey began in 2006. But the center's Kathleen Hall Jameson calls this woefully inadequate. If one doesn't understand that there are three branches, doesn't understand the protections guaranteed by the First Amendment, that lack of knowledge increases the likelihood that when asked whether someone thinks that if the Supreme Court issues unpopular rulings, it might be best to get rid of the Supreme Court, a person is more likely to say yes. Some of the divisive issues in the scope of government and constitutional protections have surfaced in North Dakota. This includes the state taking part in a lawsuit to overturn a workplace vaccine requirement for COVID-19. Mask mandate debates also surfaced at many school board meetings across the state this fall. While there's been more conversation about boosting civics education in schools, Jameson feels the responsibility lies with the public in general to learn more. She adds foundational knowledge of government is always important, but must be stressed in times like these. In an environment in which the branches are under stress, it becomes more important, not less, that the public understand why the founders set up the structure that we have. She says the news media can help by including this information when reporting on legislation or other matters related to government. The survey revealed 61% of Americans incorrectly believes that under the First Amendment, Facebook is required to allow all people to express themselves freely on the platform. And just one in three people surveyed knew the correct lengths of terms for federal lawmakers. Mike Moen, Prairie News Service. San Francisco supervisors voted unanimously and without debate to suspend the local cannabis business tax for next year. Supervisor Raphael Mandelman authored the proposal. He said that an illegal market in cannabis is flourishing by undercutting the prices of legal cannabis businesses. Mandelman said now is not the time to impose a new tax on small businesses that are just getting established and trying to compete with illicit operators. 
Partly cloudy skies predicted tomorrow for the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the mid-60s around the bay and the low 80s further inland. Partly cloudy in the Central Valley tomorrow with highs in the low 70s. Partly cloudy also in Los Angeles with a high near 70 degrees. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, December 1st. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle, bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 